third psalm. Turn over there. Let's read. Would you stand in out of honor for God's word this morning? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He, lead, he lets me rest in the meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me, and you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessings, and surely your goodness and unfailing love will surround me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we go to your word this morning, would you open the bread of life to us, and would you speak to us? Lord, anoint me, Father God. Let the words that I speak, Father, today, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yay. Now I have something I can talk into. Amen. All right. So maybe they'll hear me on the video. Praise God. Last week we talked about how the Lord is my shepherd. And there were a couple of things we brought out in that. First, that he is, not that he was, and not that he will be, but that he is. And one of the promises that we could take heed from, from the psalmist David, was that the Lord is a very present help yeah. in time of trouble. There is never a time that we need him that he is not there. There's never been a time when I called on his name where I got his answering machine that said, leave a message and I'll call you back. Uh, I think Brother Kendrick uh, called me yesterday afternoon and said, oh, did you get my voicemail? What did I say? Oh, I usually forget to check those. <laughs> How many of you are bad about checking your voicemails? Like me, when I see that I've missed a call, I don't even bother checking the voicemail, I just call back. call back. And I have no idea what I'm calling back about or why they called me in the first place. It might have been a completely trivial thing, but I saw they got a call and I'm gonna call back. But when we get to the Father, I don't have to press one for the Father and press two for Jesus or three for the Holy Ghost. And an operator will not be with me in three days, 15 hours, 12 minutes, and 42 seconds. I don't have to press one for English or two for Spanish. No, when I call him, he is my shepherd. He is there immediately. And the second thing we said, he is not just, not only is he the shepherd, but he is my shepherd. And that the promise of the shepherd is to a very specific people. It's to the people who go through Psalm 22, which is the cross. You can't get to the shepherd's pasture without first going to the cross and surrendering. That's why I love that song that we sang this morning. The reason that we are surrounded by peace is because we took all of our calamity and all of our turmoil and all of our problem and we laid it at the foot of the cross. And unless we do that, we're still carrying all that crud around with us and it's no wonder that it seems that life is up and down and crazy and there is no steadfastness and no steadiness to our lives. Then it went on to say that he lets me rest in green meadows. He makes me to lie down. And we were remembering that you can kind of picture this, that this is a, this little sheep has run over to the fence and is talking to a sheep in the next pasture and the sheep is sitting there telling how good it is to be under this shepherd. Kind of like the happy cows you see on TV every now and then. The, the cows that like to talk and how good it is in California. I, isn't that what yeah. is that, that's mm -hmm. where the, Well, this sheep is sitting there, bang, it's so good here. And when he says he makes me lie down in green pastures, it's a good thing because, like we said last week, sheep only lay down when they've had their fill. <laughs> and we can rest in knowing and having had our fill at, with Jesus. Uh, he goes on, he makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me to the still waters. Because not only does he give us what I need and sustenance, but he also gives me sometimes what I want 
He knows that sheep are terrified of rushing fast, rapid water. And he also knows that sheep will turn their nose up at stagnant water that's just sitting there. So he gives us exactly what it is that he knows will quench our thirst. That's good stuff. So today, in the NLT, which is the version I use, he says, he renews my strength. But really, the King James has a more accurate translation in this when it says, he restores my soul. I really wanted to preach to you today about how he leads me along the right path. But that's not where we're going to go today. Today, we're just going to talk about he restores my soul. Say that with me. He restores my soul. Now, to us as believers, especially as believers who believe in the idea of the eternal security of the believer, you might be like, well, wait a minute. If I'm already a sheep in his pasture, why would my soul need to be restored? My, I've already been restored. My life was reading. Remember what David said in Psalm 103? He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your, forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who restores your life from the pit of destruction. And so as believers, our lives were already restored to us. I once was lost, but now I'm found. So, but this is a sheep. This is a sheep under the care of the good shepherd that is saying he restores. Not that he restored, but he restores present tense and future tense as well. That he is there to restore my soul. So what kind of restoration is it? You know, a lot of folks would have you to believe that if you go out and you commit some sin, that immediately you have cut off your relationship with God. We all grew up under that. A lot of us grew up under that. Bless God, I've been to churches. If you didn't pay your full tithe, and I mean off the gross and not off the net, if you robbed God of 10 cents, well, you were going to have to get saved again. I, I know friends of mine who, who were members of the Church of God, Church of God is always right, praise God. And they were taught that when you, if you got saved, but then you backslid, you had to go back and do your first works. And you were going to get baptized again, and you just had to start all over again. Because, well, you lost your salvation when you sinned. But I always want to point out something very important. We've all heard the story of the prodigal son, right? Mm -hmm. The son who, who said to his father, give me my inheritance. And he went off and he squandered it. Let me point something out to you in this passage. It's very important to realize. He's still the son, even though he's the prodigal. He may be out of communion and out of fellowship with his father. He may not hear his father's voice, but he is still a son of the father. And when you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and once you have been redeemed, once you are saved, once the blood of Jesus has washed you, there is not something going to come and white out that blood. The blood covers all of your sin. Past, present, and future. It is done, Jesus said. It is done. So I don't want us to walk out of here thinking, oh, well, Brother Spin, trying to put me back under blame and shame and guilt and condemnation under the law. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, it's quite liberating when we begin to realize that the Son sets free is free indeed. He is free indeed, and we are secure forever. Now, David knew what it was like to be cast down, though. We can all say, God said of David, this man is the apple of my own eye. There's none of all the people. He, he wants to be like me. But we all know David had great iniquity. Can you remember some of the stuff David did? Do you remember the story? That in 1 Kings, David was on top of his roof. The Bible says at the time that the kings go out to make war, and he just happened to be up there. First of all, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time because he wasn't supposed to be there. He was supposed to be out going to go make war. But instead, he was sitting up on top of his roof when across the way, this gorgeous, pretty little thing named Bathsheba got out there, disrobed and got in her bathtub. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know. I can't imagine why they would have bathtubs up on top of roofs. 
And he could have blamed, and he, of course, we know the story, and I'll paraphrase it for you. He fell into sin with her. He saw her. He wanted her. He had her, and then he made sure he had her husband killed because, well, she got pregnant. And so the prophet Nathan comes to him and tells him a story. The prophet Nathan said there was a man who had just one little lamb. He loved that lamb so much he would give his life for it. His neighbor had thousands of lambs. Rich neighbor had some company coming over, and so he went over to the poor man's house, took the little lamb that that poor man loved, slew it, and cooked it for dinner. David said, you tell me who that man is. Tell me who it is. And what did Nathan do? Pointed his finger and said, it's you. And immediately contrition hit David's heart. And as we remember the story, David didn't blame Bathsheba. He didn't blame anyone else. David didn't blame the architects at Bathsheba's house for putting the bathtub up on the roof. He took responsibility and said, I've sinned against you. I did it. Nobody else. And his life needed restoration. And the Bible says he got on his face before God and God restored him. In Psalm 42, 1, it was, was that point, was that point when he was so down in the midst of his deepest, darkest hour as he's caught in despair, he cries out and he says to his soul, why are you so downcast, my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your trust in God. You see, People need restoring even the good, strong Christians. There's a whole lot of churches filled this morning on every street corner in this city, filled with sheep who need to be restored to death. Oh, you're like, where are you going with this? Well, remember that this psalm was written by a shepherd about sheep. And there is a parallel here for sheep. You see, there is a term that in the old English that's called being a cast sheep, C-A-S-T, a cast sheep. Anybody ever seen a bug on its back and it can't turn itself over? Do you know sheep end up that same way? If sheep cannot get their feet on the ground, they will stay there stuck and they cannot get off their back. They will sit there on their back They'll flail their little legs about, and but they cannot, for the life of themselves, turn. Think of a sheep. I mean, you can think of a sheep. Big, plump, rotund little thing. How are its legs? Just little, little sticks. It's kind of, if, if a, a cow would be the same way, if the cow cannot get its feet on the ground, it can't pick itself up, because that's where the strength is to get back up. How does it happen? A sheep uh, uh, will typically find some comfortable, hollowed out little soft depression in the ground, maybe on a really hot day, and it's been, it's had its fill with all the grass that it can eat, and it's just content, and it's gonna go find a place to go lay down. Well, it doesn't want to lay down on a hard ground. It wants to find a nice, soft little spot, a little depression, and so as that little sheep lays down, it'll kind of lay on its side. Its foot can still hit the ground, but maybe as it stretches and it makes itself comfortable, the center of gravity suddenly shifts and the little sheep ends up on its back. Now you might think that that happens to the poor little sheep, the weak sheep, the sheep that are skinny and scrawny. Actually, it happens most often to the healthy sheep. It happens most often to the sheep that are the strongest. The, the fattest, the plumpest, the ones with the biggest coat. You see, this is the reason that the shepherd goes and counts his sheep. Because a sheep which is cast is helpless. A sheep which is turned over on its back is completely helpless and not easily seen. And so the shepherd will go inconsistently and go count the sheep. And if he notices that one is missing, he will go find it because that sheep is the one that is on his back has been cast. See, sheep are communal animals. They don't want to be by themselves. You, you, if, if a sheep's over here and sees a herd over here, where's the one going to go? It's going to go back to the herd. And so it's not normal for a sheep to be missing. 
And the only way it wouldn't be with the rest of the group is if it's in pain, if it's hurting, if it cannot get back to them. This is going somewhere, trust me here. So the shepherd watches for cast sheep, but he also is watching for predators. He's watching for predators. Why? Because a sheep on its back is easy killings. The fox or the wolf does not have to go chase that sheep down. All, the, all that little wolf has to go do is walk right up, bite it on its neck, and choke the life out of it, and voila, lamb chops for dinner. <laughs> not good. And so the shepherd will not only be watching for the sheep, but the shepherd watches for the predators. He looks above and he watches for buzzards flying overhead. He watches for the telltale signs of the enemy lurking. And our good shepherd is the same way. Jesus said that the good shepherd will leave the 99. If he counts and he notices there's one missing, he will leave them and go find that cast sheep to make sure that the predators, the beasts of the field and the birds and the prey don't get to it before he does. What kind of sheep are cast? I've already said, the fattest, the strongest, sometimes the healthiest. The bigger the sheep, actually, the more likely it is that it will become cast. What are you saying? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think you are standing firm, you better be careful that you don't fall. There's a lot of times that we get the idea that I have been, quote, in the way for a long time. I have known Christ for 20 years. Or I, I've been saved as long as I can remember. I grew up in church. I'm not going to go and backslide. Well, the devil's too busy to mess with me. I'm a big sheep. Trust me. You're the one he wants. Because the bigger the sheep, the better the meat. With a whole lot more for him to consume. So, what does the shepherd do? The shepherd goes to, and this is what the shepherds actually call it, when they find a cast sheep, the shepherd restores the sheep. And so when it says here, he restores my soul, he is painting a very vivid picture. As the little sheep is lying on its back, and it's flailing, gases begin to build up in its digestive system because the sheep, it has to belch, but it can't because it's like this. And so now these gases begin to build up, and as these gases build up, the extremities, the legs will become weaker and weaker and weaker. And on a hot day, it can take just hours before that little sheep is dead. And so when the shepherd goes out and he looks. You know what the shepherd does? The shepherd looks and he counts and suddenly notices that one's not there. And so he goes and he finds it. And when he finds the sheep that it's on his back, he starts beating the tar out of the sheep. You dumb little sheep. You stupid sheep. How could you run away? I can't believe you are just unworthy. You ungrateful. Is that what he does? You know, you would think, listening to a lot of people, but that's how God reacts when his people fail. Because it sure is how the church treats God's people when God's people fail. Oh, come on now. I told you this was an old me sermon. <laughs> and you know, you're going to find people, if you start looking around this place, I can tell you what, I, I am so proud I pastor the most imperfect people. I, I, I do. And as your pastor, I am the most imperfect pastor. Don't you be looking at me thinking that I cannot fall on my, flat on my back and can't get back up again. And don't you ever start falling into the trap of thinking that you can't either. Because you can and you will. You're a sheep. It's a matter of time. And so I want you to begin to prepare yourself. It's not that you're planning. It's not like the little sheep lays down and like, hmm, what should I do today? Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to lay on my back and see if a wolf will come attack me. No, it happens just in a moment, just in a fleeting second. And it's the same way that the enemy comes and gets to us. It's not that we set out to go sin. It's not that we 
sought temptation out. It's not that David went on top of his roof to go look at Bathsheba on the other side. He just happened to go up there, and bam, he saw her. And in that fleeting moment, he made a decision. And in that fleeting moment, he was cast like that little sheep. He got a little too comfortable, a little bit too happy, and boom, landed on his back. The sheep, when he finds it, because he loves the sheep. But there's another reason, too. The sheep have value to him. This is how he makes his livelihood. The shepherd is not a shepherd unless there are sheep. And so, that's a deep thought, isn't it? I've often heard all these people say they, they're leaders, and then you look around and there's no one following. I'm like, not much of a leader if you ask me. But the shepherd needs the sheep. Otherwise, he's not a shepherd. Did you know that you have intrinsic value to Jesus? That should change the way you think about yourself. Because a whole lot of times, we look in the mirror and we think of ourselves as too ugly or too old or too short or too fat or too this. And we don't see the value that we have. But he, he values us so much that he was willing to pay an immeasurable price on our behalf. This is good. This is good. I, I, you know, that, that was the part you should be shouting on. Because there's going to be some... Rough stuff coming here. What does he do? He gently restores the sheep. You know, the first thing that I would do if I, because I tend to be a little less patient, and I know that comes as a surprise to some of you, I would want to go out there, pick that sheep up, and say, you dumb sheep, now get back over there. But the sheep can't. It can't do that. Why? Because it's been sitting there flailing about, and it has no strength left in its muscles. And so what the shepherd does is he gently turns it back on its side. He doesn't put it right back on its feet immediately, just sets it on its side. And then he begins to slowly massage the muscles of the legs to, to get them back to where they need to be. The little sheep stands back up and it's a little unsteady at first and the shepherd stands right by there, keeps his hand on its back so it knows it's okay. The little sheep stumbles around and when it finally gets its footing, it skips back and joins the rest of the herd. Yay! And the sheep lives happily ever after. Actually, sheep which are prone to be cast tend to do it quite often. And no matter how often the sheep gets cast, the shepherd doesn't kick it out of the herd. The sheep stays as part. Now, this is going so. It's a picture of tremendous tenderness on the part of the shepherd and a picture of tremendous helplessness on the part of the sheep. And let me tell you, we are completely and utterly helpless without our Father to help us and guide us. Anybody who walks around, and I see some of these guys, I've seen people who claim to be believers, and I've seen preachers on TV. Now, trust me, I've seen some plenty, I think a lot of them preachers on TV are as genuine as the day is long. But I will also tell you, there's some guys on there who are too big for their britches. Yeah. They think they're all right, and then some, and they can't fall, and they can't fail, and then you watch. And look what happens. And no wonder that the church then treats them with disdain because of the pride and the arrogance with which they walked. God says, stay humble. Exactly. So how did, if, if the sheep can become cast, how does a believer become a cast sheep? Why would the Lord need to restore a believer? Well, first, the first thing that the sheep does that gets it cast is it looks for a soft, comfortable spot. Listen to me. Stay out of the soft, comfortable spots. <laughs> because if, you're not, if you don't start getting all soft and mushy, if you stay firm in your convictions and stay firm in what you believe and firm in your walk with God, and as long as you stand on solid ground, you ain't going to get cast. But the moment you start looking for the comfortable way, the easy way, the thing that requires nothing, that is the moment that you are prone to falling and becoming helpless yet again. That is the moment where, like the prodigal son, you will find yourself on the other side of the world wondering, why can't I hear the voice of my father? Oh, this is... I read this last night, and it was, it was a wake-up you see, there is a there is a there is a there is an easy Christianity that is out that is preached often. It's a Christianity which 
has no need for hardship, no need for endurance, no need for self-discipline. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want, however I want, with whomever I want, and nothing is required of me. And that is not biblical Christianity. What is required of you? Everything. Just as everything was required of Jesus, everything is required of us. We have to be willing to say, not only am I, not only is the good shepherd willing to lay down his life for the sheep, but the sheep has to be willing to give up its own desires to go and graze wherever it wants and has to be willing to say what the shepherd says I'm going to do. There has to be a willingness, and it's not always easy to follow the path that the shepherd puts the sheep on. Sheep are not very good walkers. They can't run very good. There's an I've made it mentality. Well, I'm saved, so I, I've got my, I'm going to heaven now. I'm good. I got my fire insurance, Farah. I'm good. No more hell having to worry about hell for me. Well, isn't that nice? But the Bible says that God came, that Jesus Christ came to not just to give you eternal life, but to give you life here and now and that more abundantly. And if you start getting in the idea where I can just take the easy road and I think nothing is required of me, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to miss out. Yeah, it'll cost you a lot, but the benefits that you get as a result of serving Jesus Christ are worth every little tiny bit of hardship that comes along the way. My worst day with Jesus has been far better than my best day with the devil ever was. You see, the little sheep becomes comfortable. I've eaten my fill. I'm just going to lie here and be content. <laughs> sheep gets comfortable. It doesn't want to go do nothing. It just wants to sit there. You know any Christians like that? Oh, come on, Brother Spain. Preach me something good. Give me some blessing. Preach me about blessing. Oh, that's right. Oh, Lord, bless me. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. <laughs> oh, come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Yes, and I love that song. Don't get me wrong. And he will come and quench the thirsting in your soul. But it's not for you to sit there and just squander it on yourself. That's right. mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of folks, especially growing up in Pentecostal churches that I saw, that would come to church and get their Jesus fix. Mm -hmm. It was almost like an addiction. And boy, they would, they would come to church, and they would say, all right, fill me up. <laughs> they would come back next week, all right, fill me up. These are the folks that would come walk the aisle every week. Oh, pray for me, Pastor, to, for the Lord to bless me. Well, he's blessed you already. Go do something with it. Yeah. All right, we move on here. You see, the I've made it mentality, you know what the shepherd does? The good shepherd watches for this. The good shepherd watches for the little lazy sheep. The good shepherd watches the pasture and sees, oh, wait, wait, wait. This pasture is getting to be a little too comfortable for the sheep. And so what does the shepherd do with the sheep? He moves them. Now, how happy do you think the sheep are about by this? Because the sheep, they don't remember what we said last week, how the Lord described them, kind of like dumb little domesticated animals. I mean, they don't know any better. They just sit. It's comfortable. I like it here. I've got a little shade, nice little depression. It's good. And when the shepherd begins to move the sheep, the sheep go, man, no. And how many times the Lord moves you from one area of your life where things seem to be just great and you've got the idea, I've made it, I've arrived, and the shepherd says, come on, let's go. We're going over to that pasture. But Lord, that pasture is rocky. But Lord, that pasture is not. I like this pasture. And the Lord says, move. Why is the shepherd moving the sheep? For their good. For their good. Amen. They don't realize it. And so the sheep. What, what, what are sheep notorious for doing? Digging their heels in like a bunch of goats do. Sitting there, I shall not be moved. I shall not be Oh, I know that's none of you. I know. I know all y'all are holy and sanctified. There's another kind of sheep that easily gets stuck in the mud, as it were. It's the fat sheep. The fat sheep. The bigger the sheep, 
the easier it is for the center. Don't be looking at no neighbors in here right now, okay? <laughs> okay, now. Oh, you self-righteous hypocrites in here. This is symbolic I'm talking about. The little fat sheep that's just been mm, 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 munching away. Getting, the, getting that Jesus fix. You know what the shepherd's going to start doing? The shepherd's going to adjust that sheep's diet. He's going to say, hmm, maybe, maybe you're just a little bit too accustomed to all these blessings right now that you have forgotten what it means to be in need of the shepherd. So... Let me take some of this good stuff away from you for a while. Now, he'll still give you what you need in order to survive, but he will trim you back down so that you don't forget who is feeding you. I went on vacation one time, and I had a little miniature dachshund, Rusty. The cutest little thing. He was about this long and about that tall. And oh, he would look at you, and his little ears would hang to the ground, and he was just... He was, a, he was maybe, oh, a year and a half old. I was going on vacation, and uh, so I took him over to my mom, and I said, Mom, can you, can you watch Rusty for me for about 10 days? Oh, sure. Sure, sure, I will. Absolutely. And so I went, and I felt Rusty was in great hands, and so I went, had a great time, came back, picked Rusty up, brought him home, put his, and I noticed he's a, you know, Maybe a little rounder, more rotund than he was before I left. But okay, I put his kibbles down. Do you know what that dog did? Looked at those kibbles, looked at me, and I swear I'm not making this up, and I think I'm crazy. He said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> that dog wouldn't eat those kibbles. The dog would that goes, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the dog was getting bacon and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> Steak for dinner. No wonder the dog didn't want to eat the kibbles. <laughs> Guess what? The dog got used to kibbles again. <laughs> because I wasn't going to put no bacon and eggs out for him. First of all, I was too poor to go be doing that. <laughs> Second of all, I knew it wasn't good for him. Do you know there's a whole lot of people who are guilty of spiritual gluttony? And it is not good for the sheep to start getting fat. Okay, I'm just going to move on here. Whew. There's another reason the sheep get themselves cast. And I, it's my last reason. I see the clock back there. The sheep end up having too much wool. Now, of course, as the sheep, you know, the, the wool begins to grow on them. And you ever seen a sheep that, that's about ready to be fleeced? It needs to be sheared down? What does that sheep start looking like? Not very nice. Now, I'm sure the sheep thinks it's pretty good. Hey, look at my coat. <laughs> I got a bigger, fluffier coat than all of you other sheep. The only problem with that coat is it gets every kind of crud stuck in it. You don't doubt it? You don't believe me? Go get out that wool sweater that your grandma sewed for you Christmas time and wear it around for a day or so and see what all sorts of stuff gets all stuck in the middle of it. The sheep's the same way. It gets mud and crud. It gets the and all the stuff that is in the field where the sheep lays down starts getting stuck in that coat. And the, the little sheep actually becomes weighed down by its own coat. What is that? What is that a picture of? Did you know in the Old Testament, the priests were forbidden to wear wool? They were forbidden to wear wool. They could not enter into the holy place with wool. It's one of the things that was outlawed in the Levitical law. Why? Because in the scripture, the wool is indicative of the old life. It's indicative of the carnal nature, of the sin nature. It's that part of us that comes into contact with the outside world. And that stuff, if we don't keep it trimmed and cut down and neat, what ends up happening is all the crud of the world starts getting stuck in the middle of us. And before long, we become weighed down to the point where we end up finding ourselves helpless on our back. Oh, I'm telling you, I told you this was going to be the hard part here. You see, we end up lying around. The, the sheep lies around in the mud. The sheep finds a comfortable spot and lays itself down. And it just gets mudded. What do we lie around in? We get comfortable lying around in our old worldly actions, in our old worldly motives, in our old worldly desires. And oh, this one's big, in our old worldly way of thinking. 
and we start getting all that dirt around us, and before long, we get so weighed down that we can't get ourselves back up again. We end up being like the, like the, like the old commercial, help, I've fallen, and I can't get up. <laughs> now, what does the shepherd do when he starts seeing a sheep that's prone to that? He's going to get the shears out. You think the sheep enjoys it? Oh, as a matter of fact, sheep will buck and will try to get away. The shepherd has to come and has to forcefully hold the sheep down. And then he begins the shearing process. And it takes, it doesn't go quick because it's got a thick coat. He's got to get through all that crud and all the stuff. And then he starts getting in there. And every now and then there's going to be a nick in the skin. Every now and then it's going to scratch. Every now and then it's going to hurt. What am I saying? Oh, you know, our chef's more. He knows what's good for us. There's a lot of times that we get ourselves back. We're believers, but we start hanging around with the wrong crowd or thinking the wrong way. And before long, we find ourselves on our back, and our shepherd comes and gently picks us back up, massages us back, and we like that part. But then he gets the clippers out, and we don't enjoy that. But my friend, when God begins to trim off of you areas of your life that no longer belong, it is for your own good. It is for your benefit. And at the end, when the sheep has been sheared, the sheep is redeemed. Because no longer is it walking around with that big old hot coat. No longer is it going to have to smell all the clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm.